after spending an entire year kind of you know spending so much time consuming and creating content outside of work and realizing that that gave me so much more joy i knew that i need to quit corporate life. as product managers our responsibility is to set that vision and set set the strategy for the team so the team looks forward and understands clearly where we are getting to you want to get people on your team who do, does like one thing and does it really well i mean some people are unicorn right like they can do many things really well but it's rare so you want to get one person make them train them for this one specific task so they can do it really really well you're saying that you have a person who is basically taking all the dms across different platforms and responding or at least combining all of them together to uh, to send it to you so and you respond to that so that's one process hi everyone welcome back to our podcast everything product we talk about different product management concepts and different technology insights um i know in the last few weeks right everything product has been doing a bunch of videos with uh, technology leaders product leaders and we even had a couple of women in product who who were in our podcast in the last few weeks now we have another exciting speaker we have soundarya here um she's an author of couple of books she has been a very active participant in a bunch of social channels she has also been very active in immigrant communities helping them to grow their careers in us so soundarya thank you so much for taking time and welcome to everything product thank you guys so much happy to be here awesome um before we go into a lot of details right i want to start with a very quick introduction i know you were a product manager and you used to work for salesforce and then from that you transition into an entrepreneur and you're an author for a couple of books so would you mind giving a quick introduction about yourself um how was your journey etc etc uh quick intro okay so i set out to be a doctor in high school and then did a bachelor's in chemical engineering and then a masters in management science i worked as a product manager for two and a half years and i quit that to become a writer and founder so um in a way i kind of i realized some sometime when i was 20 years old that i want to live many careers in my life and at some point in my life i'd like to call myself a polymath someone who has wide ranging knowledge of several different topics i'm definitely not there yet but i feel like i've started that process by kind of dipping my toe into several different fields that interest me um so that's a quick intro no thank you so much for doing that let me um ask a quick thing just to deep dive into some of that right as product managers i'm all of us be it me or siddu or shina or many other friends that i talk to everyone wants to be an entrepreneur at some point of time they want to do something so that they can become an entrepreneur mm. can you walk us through your thought process what went into your mind that made you switch to become an entrepreneur um i okay i i don't want to be over confident and call myself an entrepreneur just yet uh, i guess i'm a solopreneur since i'm the only us employee in my company right now although i have a lot of people working helping me from india in different aspects but i think it was around 2020 a year after i joined salesforce i would wake up and spend 7 8 hours at work but then the highlight of my day every single day was the time i would spend after work at the public library um this was in bellevue washington so i would i spent almost every single day of that year in that library and read and wrote and thought a lot so after spending an entire year kind of you know spending so much time consuming and creating content outside of work and realizing that that gave me so much more joy i knew that i need to quit corporate life like this is not meant for me at least and i'm going to be really unhappy if i stay here for the long term um of course for the longest time i was running away from corporate life i didn't know exactly what i was running toward even when i quit um i wasn't very clear of what's going to happen in life i just knew that i would do this for the next 3 months and that's it after that i'll figure it out along the way so it was a very like running away and not running towards something kind of a process that i followed 
which is not true for some founders I know. Some founders, they just know that this is what they want to build and they're going to make that happen, whatever it takes. I'm just trying to say that it wasn't like that for me. Um, and so if anyone else who's like listening to this and is feeling that I want to run away from here, I don't really know exactly where I'm going to go, that's okay. I think as long as you know the next next few steps, that's enough to kind of make the whole trip until you become a founder. Um, yeah, that, that's how my, my journey was in the beginning. And it wasn't until Unshackled took off last year. And I knew that, okay, I'm going to be writing a book and I'm going to build a community for immigrants that I realized, oh, I'm actually a founder now, not just a, a writer or a course creator anymore or a product manager. No, that's awesome. Actually, can you give more details about your book, how you're growing that community and things as well? Yes. Um, so Unshackled is the name of the book and um, it's right behind me, I guess. <laughs> if you see that like blue book, that's Unshackled essentially. And right next to that is my first book, Admitted. Light blue is Admitted, dark blue is Unshackled. Um, my two babies. So Unshackled is a primer on how high-skilled immigration works in America. And it is entirely meant to give immigrants more agency in how they take decisions when it comes to immigration. So no one teaches you as a student when you come to this country that, oh, by the way, uh, if you don't get a job within 60 days, you'll be kicked out. Or that you can't, you have to get a job that is related to your degree. And that's the only way you can get sponsorship for H-1B. Or that there is this other visa called the O-1 Extraordinary Visa. That's probably better for you if you're a founder. There's just like a wealth of knowledge that is buried under legal jargon and boring legal verbose that no one wants to read about it when they go to the website. So Samir and I, Samir is my awesome co-author who's you know a licensed attorney. We decided that, okay, Samir has, he's the legal authority. I'm really good at taking complex topics and simplifying that, uh, adding stories, humor, making it more digestible. How can we join forces to write a book that feels like you're reading a thriller novel at some points, but really you're learning things that's going to change the way your future is going to play out? Because this is your future, knowing what visa you're going to get, how to get it, what not to get. It actually affects every aspect of your life. Oh, that's interesting. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the community that you're building as well? Like book authors, uh, we have seen a bunch of folks doing certain things like coming up with different principles, coming up with different ideas, etc. But typically we see a book author stopping their thought process there. But one other thing that I've seen from you is around that you're building a community so that you can help many other people. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that as well? Yeah, um, the, the community honestly came out of a, I had some notion that, okay, I should build a community around the book because there is a lot of ongoing support that we could offer to people um, and make it sustainable. And that's why, you know, Unshackled currently is only a paid community. It's not a free community. But of course, um, I publish a free newsletter every week. I publish tons of resources on LinkedIn every single day. So I realized that the community has to be sustainable for the long term and it's only meant for people who are high interest and wants to file an extraordinary visa at some point in the future like they're clear of that goal and now they need resources guidance and support to get there i think that would be the ideal candidate for me to be a member in the community um so when we started we went public with the community in August of this year. Like that's when we kind of open it up to the public and anyone can join in. We have about 320 members right now. Um, a lot of these members came from a crowdfunding campaign that I ran last year where we raised $50,000 for this whole project. Um, I'm still figuring out how to grow the community, honestly. Like I've mostly been focused on what else can we add as resources, as guidance, um, as a feature in this product that will make more immigrants file talent visas and discover 
talent visas. Um, but I'm happy to talk more about like a specific aspect based on what you'd like to know. Yeah, I, yeah. I know. So community building is not easy, right? So, you know, uh, building a crum- a communities ground up, it takes a lot of effort and, you know, also passion and you mentoring people to build communities and all. So I've experienced that like for my newsletter, I've tried doing communities on WhatsApp and all, but haven't moved into a paid community or a Slack community before, but it's it's not easy, right? There's a lot of questions coming your way and how do you manage all of that? It's, it's, it's more you have a system, a well-oiled machine that manages it or you manage the community? Uh, I don't know. How does that work? So, great question. I spent a large amount of time in the last two months training other people. Um, I'm still definitely not in a place where I can just take a step back and everything runs fine. I'm still very much a central part of this, I guess, company slash community. Um, but... For example, I have somebody whose entire job is just customer support, meaning any incoming questions across emails, LinkedIn, Instagram, my community, they're the first line of defense. Like they first see it, they take care of whatever they can themselves. And when they have a question and they don't know how to take care of it, they then come to me with that. And we have a system set up in Notion where like they'll tag me every single day and then I'll just go to Notion and respond there. Awesome. which they'll then take back and respond to people. So my point is there's a human in the loop for that. Um, and then there is another human in the loop for everything related to ops, like setting up weekly events, making sure the newsletter goes out on time every week, um, curating the topics for the weekly newsletter and um, any shipping work that comes in. Cause we also do manual shipping of the book, not just through Amazon. Um, And then I have somebody else whose job is entirely just LinkedIn, like social media. So I work with this person and they come to me with ideas for posts we could create. I write all the posts that go out. I I do a final check. um, So it never goes out without my oversight. But they take care of responding to comments. And so, you know, you you try to train these people for different aspects of things. um, And then you make sure that you document every single thing. Like, I'm a religious note taker. Like, that's one of my superpowers. Um, so we have everything we do is captured in Notion in what we call an SOP, Standard Operating Procedure. And uh, I, th- I think I sat down one week to spend like 25 hours just creating SOPs of everything I do so that I don't need to be in the loop to do those things anymore. Like, somebody else can come in and take care of that. Awesome. Nice. So- you know, uh, I I want to just unpack it a, a little bit more, right? So you're saying that you have a person who is basically taking all the DMs across different platforms and responding or at least combining all of them together to uh, to send it to you so, and you respond to that. So that's one process. And there's also this content, content curation process, which one person maybe is responsible for or you create the content and this person is kind of uh, trying to uh, distribute it across uh, all of these channels but do you have like a content creation process i know a lot of people talk about a content always like there's there's justin welsh online right he does a lot of that yeah, stuff yeah. right you create a, a engine to discovery right packet all of these things into different buckets and all of that like what's your process for the content creation um, we have an idea dump on Notion where uh, if you notice, I'm sure you, you know, if you like notice my, observe my LinkedIn content closely enough, you'll see that there is a pattern. Uh, there are certain topics that I consistently post about. So I generally try to post at least two resources every week, something that's resourceful. Um, two stories, you know, like I, I love capturing stories and rewriting them from my life and from other people's lives. I try to post one news item, like any news of the week that's important that people need to know about. Um, And one maybe opinion piece on something. And finally, one content on supporting somebody else. Like I have a lot of creative friends who are doing awesome things. So I just try to set aside one day. If any of them need me to promote anything they're working on, I would just do that for them. So I, I think when you create like these, this system, um, and we just start documenting anytime we get an idea, we would just go and put it in the idea dump. No, not overthinking, just go and write it there. And once a week, 
we'll take a look at the ideas to see, okay, which ones do we feel excited about writing about this week? Um, and once we finalize that, I will take the help of this person who works with me to give me a V1. Like when I say V1, I mean talking points if it's a news item, getting me some reference articles, doing some preliminary research before I sit down to go all in. Because when I sit down, it takes me two and a half hours like a very deep thought to write, say, five or six posts for a week. But when I sit down and do that, I want to make sure that we've already done the process until then to sit down and do a great job of writing the post. And once I'm done writing it, they'll take care of publishing and so on. Awesome. So you have a you know, kind of well-oiled machine at this point to do that. But I, you know, it's the machine. I don't know if it's well-oiled. <laughs> Sure, no, I, I always wondered that, right? Like I, I've, I've been seeing your content on LinkedIn and I think first I came across your profile through a video which was done by Singh in USA or some, you know, some YouTube channel. Yeah, and I you were know. talking about all of your journey and, you know, you being a product manager and your book and all of that stuff. So since then I've been looking at your LinkedIn post and also I thought like trying to understand it better, what's your process, you know? Thanks for throwing some light there. Yep. I actually, uh, when, when you were walking through all of this thought, pro all of this process, right, I could totally relate to a bunch of things a product manager does too. Like whenever you're trying to bring up a feature or bring up a product on a weekly basis, let's say you're working with your operations teams, you're working with your sales teams to say, hey, this is how let's build the product. Like you work with your business team to understand that you work with the engineering to build it. Then you as a product manager sit to figure out, okay, this is exactly how I want to launch it. You have your GTM teams to like post it at different places and stuff. I could totally relate each and every step to that. That's awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, I right before this podcast, I was talking to a friend of mine and we were talking about how, you know, you want to get people on your team who do, does like one thing and does it really well. I mean, some people are unicorn, right? Like they can do many things really well, but it's rare. So you want to get one person, make them, train them for this one specific task so they can do it really, really well. And um, and, and then make sure that everyone in the team understand what is the bigger goal we're doing this for. So I don't think we're, we're, I'm there yet, to be very honest. Like I have done a good job of training people and documenting things, but I'm myself figuring out how do I paint that bigger picture to all of them so that they they keep reminding themselves, so this is why I'm doing this right now. And this is how it's going to add up to this bigger goal. Um, I haven't yet had like a all team. I know they, they say offsite and all hands and so on. I work with a bunch of people. Like I, I currently I was thinking I work with like eight people on very different things. But I haven't really gotten all of them in one room together yet. Um, that's something for me to plan out. But it does feel like running a small product management team, which I'm sure you both do on a daily basis. Yeah, I could relate that also, right? So as product managers, our responsibility is to set that vision and set, set the strategy for the team. So the team looks forward and understands clearly where we are getting to. I think that's exactly what you're trying to do there. You're almost rallying people towards that mission every day, right? You keep reiterating that to every person, right? Yeah. Almost every time, yeah. Yep. One other thing I want to ask you, Sandhya, is um, on the book launch events, right? So I've seen you hosted like awesome book launch events. I, I honestly wanted to come come there as well, but couldn't come. But oh, can you talk more about how you do it and then uh, how you were able to do such things? Gosh, I haven't sat down to think about like the madness it was to host that 250 member event uh, in, in a good way. Like it was a lot of chaos in a very short amount of time. Um, I've realized those few months when you have a deadline, you don't have a choice. You have to get it done. That's like a pressure cooker for growth because you learn so many things so fast. And then you just let off steam for a while after that, you know? Um, that's, what, that's what the whole event experience felt like for me. I started with sponsors, of course. You need sponsors to host event. I So I started selling tickets for the event from October of last year. When we had the crowdfunding campaign, there was one tier that said launch party tier. That was the seed of it. 
because back then we were like, okay, let's create some reward tiers for crowdfunding. Oh, and we were like, oh, it wouldn't be so cool to have a launch party tier. And we just put it in there without thinking that much. But then we realized, okay, some 30 people chose that tier, which means now we don't have a choice. We have to host a launch event because people have paid for it. Then the next step is I sent out one of the things I did really well, which I also talked about on a LinkedIn post is giving consistent progress updates to people in my orbit. And when I say people, these are founders of companies, lawyers, um, high profile people in general. So every six to eight weeks, I would send them an update saying, here's what we did in the last six to eight weeks. So in one of those emails, I said something like, hey, we're thinking of hosting a 250 member launch event. I just threw out a number. I didn't even know if we could get 250. I was like, let's aim for it. And then I said, um, and we're looking for a few sponsors. If you're interested, just hit reply. And a few people replied. And we got sponsorships just from that one email. Like there was no outbound marketing of let's go and get sponsors. It was very inbound and organic. But in People kept seeing the progress. At some point, they were like, I'm going to get on the wagon at this point because I'm seeing progress. So then we got sponsors. And once we got sponsors, things became a bit clearer because you know what the sponsors want. You know what you want to do. Um, and now it's like, how do you get 250 people to come to the event? So that kicked off this whole effort of trying like 10 different things. And um, I remember reading this book on how to host an event. It's called The Art of Gathering by Priya Parker. And she really, you know, she does a great job of describing why it's so important to describe the why of an event. Like, why, 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 why are you doing this? And so I wrote down like six reasons for why I'm doing the event. And then she says, no, choose one why. Like, choose that one why and that has to be like a bouncer. You know what's a bouncer at bars? people who kick out, mm -hmm. who are not fit for the bar. Um, so that the why that you choose has to be a bouncer for all the other ideas you get, which dilute the event. If you get, like, let too many ideas come in. So my why was simple. I want to connect people who've, who are interested in filing an extraordinary visa with people who can help them, like as many of those connections as possible. So we designed the entire event around that. Um, Hope that gives you kind of a evolution of how this happened. Just a quick comment there. So your book is based on a certain idea. And then that idea is basically to help folks who are either struggling in, in US or who wants to do certain things in US and want to get the immigrations and stuff. And the thought process of bringing that people together was also awesome because when you launch a book, it could be as simple as, okay, you go to a LinkedIn post and then tell that, hey, this is my book. but Rather, you took that grandier approach where you went ahead and said, hey, I'm going to actually bring in people who really need that help. And I'm also going to bring people who can actually help them and launch the book so that the real impact will be seen. Yeah, I actually never thought about it because I could have just made it like a boring book event where people come and listen to me read a page from the book. And then, you know, there's like book signing, people get a book and they leave. But that wasn't exciting. Like, what's the point of, you know, um, and, but this, this doing this was so much more exciting because it also made me do a lot of things. I feel very uncomfortable doing in general, like asking for money from people for giving them value in exchange. Um, like a year and a half ago, or even a year ago, I, I didn't know how to do that. Like, I didn't know how to not feel guilty when I take money from people and rather feel like, okay, I took the money. Now, how can I give them 5x what they've paid me in terms of value? That's the right way of thinking about it, right? Not, oh God, now I got $100. Like, what am I going to do to repay this? <laughs> um, mm. That was a big shift for me in launching the event. We charged, the ticket price was $150. And then we gave a lot of discounts. So, you know, most people paid $100. Um, but I was very hesitant to set it at $150. I was like, I think I should just stop it at 75, not more than that. And some people actually told me, they said, if you go anything, anything over $50 or max 75, people are not going to buy it. But then there was a friend of mine, Prithvi, who kind of coached me through this. And he said, no, you're going to set a price, like set a high price 
and you're going to set it like set the bar high to make it a really premium event that's how you should think about it so um that was one thing second was sending so many cold emails like i sent some 250 cold emails to journalists uh who could come and cover the event for press and we actually got five journalists to come and cover the event which was really cool and um third would be just getting comfortable i don't know talking about yourself it's i i don't know how you guys feel about it but i feel like the the least interesting and kind of anxious part of my job is promotion where i have to go and tell people that oh i did this i did this i did this you know after a while even i'm like oh i i'm boring myself i keep saying <laughs> um or i'm annoying myself at this point but you realize that that's what it takes to actually make an impact is that people need to know what you're doing on a consistent basis and you have to keep showing value and progress even if you hate it like that that's really you know you know geico the insurance company right mm-hmm, mm-hmm. like you see them pretty much everywhere and i mean after a point it's like can you guys stop creating ads <laughs> but the time the first time i thought oh i need to get car insurance the first person i thought of was geico like let's just go get it because that's when i remember <laughs> yeah <laughs> doing some funny things mm-hmm. but um i learned a lot about what works in marketing that's right and also right people underestimate, underestimate the effort it takes to reach out to so many people right I, i see a lot of people complain after reaching out to 5 10 people so it takes you so you know so many cold emails to get to that spot where you have people coming in right yeah awesome yeah um i just wanted to say you're going to piss off some people yeah it's just going to happen and they'll forgive you because you know they have busy lives this your your one email out of 100 emails in their day and and there are also people willing to help there right so yeah right yeah. awesome so i had like little curious on on your book journey right so if you were to like put uh, uh, this the story together like how did you get the idea what was the process of writing a book and how did you publish it what would that be yeah okay i'm trying to break it into different phases phase 1 is deciding that you're going to write a book um in our case that happened because we went public samir and i went public and said we're going to write a book if we get 1000 people to sign up through this link and we got you know we got a lot of people i i don't remember exactly if it was 1000 people but certainly we got more than 500 people sign up through the email and lots of people commenting in the like comment section and encouraging us to go ahead so that kind of crystallized the idea that we should do this um the second step was in my case and specifically for this book it was crowdfunding like generating early true fans and money to go out and do this so we ran the campaign we raised 50k um and then i also got a grant a week later after the crowdfunding campaign ended from emergent ventures uh, who really care about promoting high skill immigration so i don't think that's a necessary step to be honest um i mean my first book i wrote without any sort of crowdfunding i just wrote the book but it was a great step because forget the money you raise from crowdfunding right the no- amount of awareness you generate because of the crowdfunding campaign and the number of partnerships you can build is insane because you only have 30 days so you start thinking very like creatively you start thinking okay i have 3 days to do this how desperate can i get and what are all the desperate things i could do so you don't think normally anymore and that helps um the third phase was outlining the book so once we raised the money uh, even before that we we knew kind of the outline of what's going to go in so samir and i and ben who was like a research collaborator we would meet for every chapter we met for like 2 hours to create the outline of each chapter um and after the call i would go back and listen to the whole recording again and pick out like places where i feel like you know what i think we should change this a little bit look i would spend a lot of time thinking about the outline 
uh, fourth step was to actually write, to do the research, to write, rewrite, write again. And that's, I guess, a very long step. It, it took me four months or three, four months to finish that writing journey. Um, probably the best three, four months of my so is and, it like writing every day or you had a dedicated time writing? Yeah, I would kind of wake up, um, you know, go running. This was in India, by the way. I was in India for okay. most of the uh, Go running, come back, get ready, go to this office. And when I say office, it's it's like a eight by 10 foot, really small space where there was just enough space for a desk. Anyways, it didn't, it didn't matter because I would just go in, sit there and start researching um i would focus on like at one point i'll only focus on one chapter not more than one so i'll be doing a ton of research noting down ideas and start like writing it and the next day i come back and read the whole thing again and i'm like okay i don't like this let me rewrite it so it's a lot of that um and once that phase was over there was proofreading so we got like 25 proofreaders from my newsletter who volunteered to help us. So okay. I did the project management. It was a complex optimization wherein I got people to tell me what chapters they're interested in proofreading. And then I had to create a matrix table, put them in the right chapter, send those chapters to them. Um, and then they would comment and we would incorporate the comments. A lot of fun optimization. Um, and then there is, while all of this is happening, by the way, there's also design happening in the back end. So I worked with a graphic designer, uh, Komal, from India, who also worked on my first book. So if, I don't know if you've seen Unshackled. It's a design-heavy book. It's not mm -hmm. just black and white text. We have lots of infographics and illustrations and charts. So Komal was creating all of this in the back end while I was working on this. And finally, I recruited a an editor. I thought I could just get a few friends to edit the book, and that's enough. I couldn't be farther from the truth, like, truth. Thankfully, my mentor, Rajesh, convinced me to hire a professional editor, someone who's done this her entire life. And she actually has edited even Seth Godin's book. Like I got, you know, someone who ah. edited Seth Godin's book. Wow. Uh, Anayak <laughs> Alkasas, this fantastic editor from Australia. And worked with her for two months, rigorously, wherein she read the whole manuscript and the whole manuscript was 100,000 pages, uh, sorry, 100,000 words. And then she would reread the whole thing, like make a bunch of comments come back to me. It was like a football you know, match, you know, like back and forth. We would keep passing the ball to each other. Um, and after all of this was done, you put the entire book together with all the design on Figma. We used Figma to put the book oh. together. Okay. Which is weird, right? You don't really use Figma for books, but... I didn't know people use Figma for books. But... <laughs> we used it and in hindsight, maybe we could have used Adobe Illustrator, but yeah, we used Figma because it's it allows for real-time collaboration, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. And after everything was done, I remember there was like a seven-day marathon session I did where I printed the entire book on paper and went through it line by line top to bottom like 10 times for those seven wow. days and marked a ton of errors like you would think oh after all this process why would there be errors but in a book of a hundred thousand words there will always be errors so i found like a hundred errors went back corrected them printed again reviewed found errors went back so we did a few times and finally sent it to the printer on may 11th so it was it like a six month, eight month process or how long was it the whole process from idea to the point you launched the book? August 11th was when I, sorry. Yeah, August 9th was when I, when we went public about it. That was just a mere idea back then. And July 22nd is when we had the launch event. So you could say it was almost a year long process. Yeah. It takes a lot of commitment and effort to get through that for sure. Yeah. To be honest, um, okay, it took very little commitment because once you do a crowdfunding campaign, it's kind of set in stone that we're going to do this. Like we've promised people. Um, and honestly, the, 
it didn't even feel like work you know i would wake up every day work on this i would go back to sleep and it would feel like i just had a fun day there was no work involved um but yeah i mean that's just me talking from a very idealistic standpoint of how work can be fun too Oh, no, this is autumn awesome. awesome right we had like lovely conversations on the day yeah. and couple of things that we do like when we are wrapping up the podcast is asking uh, asking our guests what they love the most let's say it could be books or movies or podcasts and stuff maybe let me start with books like i know your books are awesome like i i even for the uh, viewers i'm going to link the books and uh, the unshackled website as well for anyone who who is interested other than your books anything uh, that you would recommend for the viewers like anything that inspired you um so okay i i don't have like this one book inspired me more than everything else but it comes in phases right now the book that i'm thinking the most about is a book called tuesdays with mori by mitch album it's a really beautiful soulful book about how to live a good life um i'm thinking so much about it because the next book i want to write is kind of a sequel to tuesdays with mori which was written 23 years ago so this book inspired me to write the next book that i want to write so i would highly recommend anyone to read that that's nice and uh, one other thing we usually ask is the podcast like uh, do you listen to any podcast if so uh, anything you would recommend um i used to a lot before I don't right now um but I mean in Colombia when I was a student I really enjoyed how I built this um with Kairas I'm sure any product junkie probably likes that um besides that I listen to this really like what um unique podcast called Secular Buddhism it's only 15 minutes it's very short um but it's like one buddhist lesson per day so when i would take a, like 2021 from getting to my house to the co-working space it was exactly 15 minutes so the exact time i needed to listen to an episode of this podcast so i really enjoyed that as well okay awesome awesome um maybe a last question right so if there is two things that you would recommend to the viewers like be it product managers or be it anyone who wants to start this journey right uh, what would that recommendation be i would just recommend one thing i don't even think the second um when i quit what helped me the most or saved me honestly was having somebody to call anytime i needed support so for anyone who's thinking of quitting or wants to start their own company or do something different um make sure you have that support system before you do that like somebody that you can call at 2 a.m. and cry or someone that you can you know call to vent or ask for sound advice um i know it's not easy to find this person i found this person in my mentor rajesh but that's my advice this is wonderful sandeep yeah thanks again for your time we had wonderful conversation and for everyone who is watching uh, this is everything product so don't forget to subscribe thank you thank you